Newly appointed International Court of Justice Judge Professor Tladi Dire says the ICJ relies on the cooperation of states and other stakeholders in order to be effective. Professor Dire, who is a South African-born international law expert, will soon be heading off to the court at The Hague. SABC's international news editor Sophie Mugwena spoke to him on a number of issues. South Africa is continuing to occupy important space on the global stage. We saw last week the United Nations electing a South African to be a judge at the International Court of Justice. We are going to be in conversation with uh, Professor Adi Dire, who has been elected to be a judge at the International Court of Justice. Prof, let's start. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. A difficult task lying ahead. In terms of this court, can you perhaps start by sharing with us the role of this court and also where it is situated? Yeah. So the court is, is based in The Hague. Um, and its functions, it, it's described in the, um, in, the, in the UN Charter as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Uh, but its primary function is really to um, resolve disputes between states concerning international law. So if there's any dispute, it doesn't matter what, what the subject matter of the dispute is, whether the, the dispute is environmental issues, human rights, uh, law relating to boundaries, who owns what territory, the law of the sea. As long as it's a dispute between states, um, the function of this court is to resolve um, those disputed. Also has a mandate in something called advisory opinions, which is um, where an organ of the United Nations or some other competent organization requests the court for, uh, for um, uh, advice, if you like, on a particular legal issue. Well, in terms of how it is constituted, mm -hmm. how is it constituted? Yeah, so the court is composed of uh, 15 members. Um, um, and there isn't, there isn't technically under the statute um, geographical or regional representation, but there is a practice among states um, to vote in such a manner that the court actually represents um, an equitable geographic representation. There's also been a practice in the past that um, P5 states are always represented. Um, but we've seen that practice gradually changing. In 2019, the UK judge lost, and so for, a, for the first time in the history of the court, there wasn't a UK judge, and this year, uh, last week, uh, the Russian judge lost, and so um, now there's two members of the P5 that are not represented on the court. But that's the basic um, structure of the court. Let's look at the, uh, the difference between the International Court of Justice mm -hmm and the International Criminal Court. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> the ICC, the yes. famous one. Yes, the famous one. And, I, and I, I'm not sure why the ICC is the famous one, because the most important one, at least in my view, is the, is the International Court of Justice. But I guess it's the famous one because the, the issues that it deals with are, are always almost sort of like in your face. But the International Criminal Court really is concerned with criminal prosecution of individuals who have committed particular crimes, um, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, um, and aggression, right? So that, that but um, the International Court of Justice, on the other hand, um, one, its subject matter jurisdiction is not limited to international criminal matters, so it can deal with international criminal matters, of course, but it can deal with other matters, but also, and most importantly, it deals with disputes between states. So the ICC doesn't deal with disputes between states, it's focused on individuals, and the guilt or innocence of individuals in the commission of crimes. But there is a relationship between the two, by the way, but they, they are different courts. The relationship, how can the two cooperate? Yeah. So I think um, the best way to sort of describe the relationship is just to say, well, the ICC also has jurisdiction to deal with criminal matters. Um, but in dealing with criminal matters, it will be dealing with, with more um, interstate disputes. And so, for example, um, you know, one of the most famous cases that the ICJ has dealt with, um, the arrest warrant case, um, concerned the question which we've had to deal with, um, whether or not a Minister for Foreign Affairs can be prosecuted domestically in, in a, in a, in a um, domestic court in Belgium. Um, and there, the questions relating to immunity, the very same questions that we saw facing us in respect of Putin, 
um, you know, and Bashir were at play. So in that respect, there is a relationship between the court. Um, in terms of cooperation, um, these two courts are, are, are independent courts. And so while, of course, we always describe the ICJ as the, the apex court, uh, um, the most important court, in reality, as far as uh, law is concerned, they are on an equal footing. Um, um, one always expects that uh, if the reasoning of the decisions of one court are cogent, then the other court will be convinced by them and will follow them. I think that's the extent of the cooperation. In relation to the International Court of Justice, for cases to be before the court, is it a referral by the Security Council, as it's been done on other matters in relation to the International Criminal mm. Court? Or can it be an individual lodging a complaint or a country that is aggrieved? How, mm. how, how do we get to have a case before the International Criminal Court? That's probably the most important question that I've been asked um, in this. The, the ICJ's jurisdiction is limited um, to the fact that a state must have consented to the jurisdiction. So um, the principal way in which a, a case can come before the International Court of Justice is if one state that is aggrieved um, submits that particular case to the ICJ. But that's not enough. Um, the court will then have to satisfy itself that the other state um, that is being brought to the ICJ has actually consented in one way or the other to the jurisdiction of the court. And there's different ways that consent can come. I mean, one way that consent can come is uh, two states can get together and say, we have this dispute between us, we can't resolve it, let's agree, and they, they enter an agreement that's called a compromise to submit the matter to the ICJ. That's the most common way. The other way is there might be a treaty that exists on a subject matter, like, for example, the Genocide Convention. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I mean, the Genocide Convention is a 1948 convention. Um, one state, which is party to the Genocide Convention, might say, in the Genocide Convention, we have agreed that if there's any dispute between any of the parties, the ICJ will have jurisdiction. So that's a consent that's given even before the dispute arises. And on that basis, a state can be then taken to the ICJ. A typical example here is um, uh, the Ukraine-Russia dispute, which is currently before the ICJ. We know that that dispute is actually about the use of force, uh, but Ukraine actually used the Genocide Convention because both states are part of the Genocide Convention as a basis for submitting the case to the ICJ. So a country must be part of a convention to this court. Right. So if a country is not or didn't sign up to the convention. Do we have such cases? Yeah, I mean, um, we, um, we as South Africa have, a, have a, a boundary dispute with Namibia, for example, over who owns, um, who owns um, the Orange River. It's a, it's a legal dispute which could potentially be resolved by, um, by the International Court of Justice. Um, but none of the two states can drag the other one to the ICJ because there isn't a treaty specifically which would grant the, the ICJ jurisdiction over that particular case. Um, so the only way in which that particular dispute, for example, can find itself before the International Court of Justice if, if the two states agreed that, look, this dispute has been you know, going on for too long, let's let the ICJ resolve it. The reason being, are we not signatories? The reason being that we don't have a treaty that that um, that uh, grants the ICJ jurisdiction. So again, there's different ways in which the jurisdiction of the court can be founded. All of those w ways are based on some kind of consent. So we are party to the ICJ statute, no problem. But that's not enough. You also have to specifically agree for that dispute in question to come before the ICJ. So there's no there's no that second kind of consent. Um, um, you know, is not existing in, in respect of that particular dispute. Let's look at the current uh, political and security situation mm. around the world. You have lots of uh, conflicts mm -hmm. on the continent. Mm -hmm. You have, again, bigger wars. You spoke about the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. and now the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In relation to the Middle East question, can that matter? be brought before the International Court of Justice so that you are able to settle the Middle East 
question in relation to Israel and Palestine mm. once and for all so that we don't have these conflicts mm. that always come up at a time where the world is really struggling mm. to recover from COVID, uh, mm. adding more challenges yeah. for the globe. Again, another important question which gives me an opportunity to say a little bit more about um, about um, how matters can be brought to the ICJ. Um, in fact, as we speak currently, um, one of the cases before the ICJ, one of the cases in inverted commas before the ICJ, um, is actually a, um, an advisory opinion, uh, a request for an advisory opinion um, concerning the situation in Palestine. Um, so remember at the beginning I spoke about the fact that the function of the court is resolving disputes between states, but also providing advisory opinions to organs of the United Nations or competent international organizations. Um, and in, um, um, I believe it was in December of last year, the General Assembly adopted a resolution in which it requested the International Court of Justice um, to provide an advisory opinion on um, the rights and obligations of, of, of states, in particular Israel, um, in respect of the, um, the situation um, in Palestine. So. The particular hearings of, 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 of that particular advisory proceedings will actually be um, the first one in which I will sit on. It'll be um, in um, it'll be I think on the 18th of February. That was the date that I that I think I saw on the the website. Um, the only thing that I will say about that though is is um, you know like with many things, the ICJ is a, is part of a system. It's 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 a cog in the system, um, but in it itself it isn't going to resolve it. What the ICJ can do is the ICJ can clarify the rules. But ultimately, um, the, implementation. the implementation is still required, um, 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 and that's for the General Assembly to do, that's for states to do, not only the state that's particularly identified in the request for advisory opinion and presumably in the, 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 um, so the advisory opinion itself, depending on what the advisory opinion says, um, but also broadly other states, uh, I think, will also have a role in sort of ensuring um, um, the implementation of, 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 of the content of that advisory opinion. Um, and just on that last point, let me just say, we've had, um, you know, we as South Africa, um, there was an advisory opinion against us, if you like, um, in 1971 concerning the application of apartheid in Namibia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think if you speak to most international lawyers, they will tell you that that advisory opinion played an extremely important role in sort of ultimately resolving um, our own situation, so to speak. That led to the freedom of right. Namibia. That's correct. From the rule of the yeah. former apartheid regime. That's correct. And this court, for it to be effective, you also must ensure that there's political will among world leaders. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's absolutely correct. In the history of the ICJ, we've seen um, We've seen several judgments of the ICJ that um, were not complied with, or at least not complied with uh, timelessly. Um, uh, in fact, the very first judgment of the ICJ um, in 1949, um, you know, was not complied with. Um, you know, um, by Albania, um, we've seen the U.S. Um, um, you know making a, a clear statement that they would not comply with the judgment of the ICJ in, in, um, in the 1980s. You know, we've seen Iran do the same things, and so there is this history. Um, and then ultimately, what we have to remember is that international law is not like domestic law. There's no police force that's going to come and arrest the state, and so ultimately. Um, the functions of the court are to clarify the rules, but ultimately it is for the political processes to make sure that those rules that are clarified by the court are in fact complied with. So you're absolutely correct. It does ultimately depend on political will. And no recourse in instances where the party or the people or the country that are involved are not complying. I mean, there is theoretically recourse. Um, um, the Charter of the United Nations provides that the Security Council has a mandate, indeed a responsibility, to ensure compliance. But of course that particular provision um, is not very often, in fact, never um, used. And that um, will depend on the strength of the Security that's Council. Uh, Currently it's a divided house. The political, it depends on the political will of the Council. Um, but more than that, I think, um, um, so there's also the political will of the state itself that is facing the, the decision, um, you know, the opinion of the court. 
Um, but I also think, thirdly, um, you know, apart from the state itself and the Security Council um, or the multilateral system, there's also a responsibility in other states. Um, um, we all accept the ICJ, um, and therefore, to the extent that there's a state that's not complying with decisions um, and judgments of the ICJ, I think it's imperative for other states to also put pressure and apply whatever um, uh, uh, influence that they have, um, of course, within the confines of international law, to ensure um, compliance with, um, so with decisions of the International Court of Justice.